Jim Hunsinger from Lean Frontiers, along with uh, uh, Joachim Verstrom from Lean Ability, uh, bringing you this part two, second webinar of a series we're doing on uh, having a discussion on standard work, kind of brought to you by Lean Frontiers, um, Lean Ability, and Business New People. So last November, November 29th, we had never webinar one, uh, kind of called Inside Out, where Joachim kind of discussed the context of standard work. But today he's going to dive into some key con concepts for success of uh, standard work. So um, with and, and if you have any if folks have any questions, um, don't hesitate to put them into the chat or the Q and A, and I'll work to manage that to uh, get them to Joachim to for those questions. So with that, Joachim, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Jim, and thank you for for having me. Uh, so today we uh, we continue this kind of dialogue about uh, standardized work and uh, what we're trying to achieve here is just to summarize or, or get a broader picture of what standardized work is. Uh, my uh, my experience is we we often get tied down by the nitty gritty stuff the. Uh, some templates and uh, stuff like that. Uh, and here we, we sort of raise the bar a little bit uh, and look at some foundational uh, concepts that, that are necessary to get um, you know, standardized work to fly. We do appreciate any questions you have. Please put them in the, in the chat. We, we try to do this more like a dialogue uh, thing than just a straight off um, a straight off presentation or me talking to a PowerPoint. So, so we're going to cover five five things today, which is um, how do we build an organization or design our organization. Uh, um, we also talk about a concept called labor linearity, um, the concept of leveling or a hey junka for those of you who are familiar with that, um, right sized equipment and ultimately product design, how that can influence uh, our standardized work. Um, so when we talk about organization design, if we go for that one first, um, what, we, what we talked about last time was uh, every arrow, uh, all, the, all the support functions, uh, the whole organization needs to be pointing towards that value adding person that is at the end of the day is the one who's delivering value to our customer. And the value adding person is the last one who actually sees our product or service before it's delivered to customers. Uh, what is important with organization design is because it's, it's difficult to give a, an answer to you should uh, um, build this or you should have this. It's all going to be depending on what kind of service, what kind of product uh, are you actually producing or, or giving to your customers. Uh, but the key concept for me, what I found is, are we actually uh, designed to create flow? Or are we actually, by default, by design, uh, creating places where we need to uh, stop the flow of value, uh, put it in a queue, having lots of handovers. How, how are we actually, by design, designed for flow? Uh, standardized work, end of day, should mean that our value is flow. Uh, that was the concept that Teichu Ono was struggling with all the time when he design the TPS system is how do we get to flow? Uh, and organization design can actually um, lead to unnecessary waiting, batching, queuing, waiting times, uh, and all of that. Yo so that, that's like key point number one. Yeah, you'll keep something on that, I might add in, just because you know both you and I have, have a background in TWI, people training within industry, and also uh, you know Toyota Kata, in a way, from a, uh, from a Toyota perspective, but Ono, 
those were actually skills and means he used to help achieve what you're talking about flow. So I think that's important to know with people doing that, the whole continuous improvement thing, um, even from a Toyota perspective is trying to channel into creating that flow you're talking about. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't say that there's one specific design of organization that is the ultimate. And that, that's going to depend on whatever situation you're in. Uh, but you need to look at it from the outside and say, uh, are we actually by design in our organization creating uh, batching, queuing, waiting times? Uh, and how do we actually, uh, how do we go to flow where you can and pull where you must? Uh, the other key point around uh, organization design is it has to have um, resource. It, there's ha and there has to be time. There has to be um, opportunity to actually develop. Um, because if we slim our organizations down to the bare minimum, well, nothing's going to happen. You're going to be stuck in whatever position you're in, but you're never going to move. And I've been struggling with um, uh, management teams all across the world where it's it's extremely difficult to take that decision uh, that we need some resource who's actually going to develop us to the next level. Um, I was working with one client that is in automotive and they actually signed contracts where... Uh, Year one, the price is 100. Year two, the price is 97, and so on. Uh, so you need to decrease your price 3% every year. And my question to them is, well, who's actually working on making that decrease in cost possible? And they go, we don't have that person. We can't afford to have that person. And in my world, what we're saying is we have just signed a death warrant <laughs> uh, where this organization will die eventually because we're simply running out of cash or profitability. Uh, so two things. Make sure you have an organization that is capable of flowing value. The other one is an organization that has the resource to develop new ways of thinking, new ways of doing, um, that will lead to better results. Yeah, Does that so, make sense? Yeah. One thing is, that is um, I know another thing, thinking back to the, from the Toyota perspective, is the development of flow was actually not only to bring the better value and all that to their customer, of course, that was part of it. Another part of it was to work on decreasing the cost, decreasing their internal cost, of the product. So as you said, they ideally maintain the margin or even better through those improvements, get better margin as the, as the product uh, life cycle uh, matures. Exactly. And, and I think we, what we do a lot of times, we do kind of Excel sheet exercises and we think we can reduce uh, a head count. But uh, the downside of that is we're gonna stand still because everybody's just occupied with status quo. Uh, and that is simply uh, telling ourselves uh, that we're not going to move uh, and telling the organization. And then it's not aligned with visions or missions that, that we need to move and we need to move fast. Uh, we've seen... Um, uh, the um, the truck manufacturer Scania here in Sweden, uh, they went from having um, really big teams, and this is perhaps 15, 20 years ago. Um, so a team lead would have 20, 25 people in the team, and their pace of improvement was kind of slow. They reduced it to half. Now we're down to 10 people. Still, yeah, it picked up, but not too big. And eventually they landed in the classic five to one. So one team need five people. And all of a sudden, boom, uh, productivity, quality, and uh, they started to move. And that's been one of their key key concepts for success in the past couple of years. Joachim, with that question, so 
obviously as they brought that alignment in, you know, 20 to I guess one person in supervisory role and down and down to five to one, I'm assuming from the supervisory role that increased cost or were they mm -hmm. able to actually, did their costs go up? They stay the same. Were they actually able to reduce costs by doing that? So uh, what happened was uh, uh, the, in the pace of improvement was so big. Uh, so if you get 10% productivity increase every year, year on year, uh, you'll get that back um, by a lot. So, uh, but if you just look at, look at it for now and for the coming quarter, you're going to say that's not a good idea. But if you want to have 10% year on year, well, uh, that's a different story. Uh, so those are the two things that I would would sort of get out there that we uh, we need to invest that that time and space for the uh, for your organization to actually grow. Um, another key concept that is not commonly talked about is something we call labor linearity, which is uh, when we build. Uh, a production line or a set up some kind of uh, workplace. Uh, usually what happens is if, say you're uh, one person doing the job and your productivity is, is 100, uh, but if we move to two people, that perhaps that, that goes up a bit because we can be more efficient in two. Uh, when we're at three, we can actually peak and say, okay, this is the perfect setup for uh, for this job, but if we add another four person number four, well, uh, it actually goes down again because that's going to increase waiting times within the flow and so on. Uh, so it's almost like a normal distribution curve of of productivity. Uh, what we want to achieve is a flexibility that means if if demand goes down and we need to go from that optimal three people setup, how can we actually do that? How can we create standards that are good enough so productivity actually stays the same no matter if you're one, two, three, five, six? You know, creating that flexibility of being able to adjust to uh, fluctuations in in demand and I think that that, that concept um, today it seems like uh, flexibility is is becoming the core core survival um, treat of any organization and uh, now we're back again to freight costs going up and delays and yeah it seems like it's been going on since 2020 with with COVID and, and all of that um, so uh, this is probably the new normal. So how do we create the, the conditions so we can ramp up and down according to current demand without losing productivity? So labor linearity for me is when we push that, um, it's almost like it's a, it's a paradigm shift that we, we believe it needs to be that normal distribution line. But if that's not true, if we change that, then we need to work even harder on our current standards to make sure we, we can actually do that. Uh, it's not an uh, impossible trait. It can actually be done. Uh, but it does, need, it does need a significant amount of, of work to make it work. On that, you know, Kim, what are what are some of the techniques organizations use in order to accomplish that? So I think it ties into the other things that we're heading at. We're uh, we're getting into leveling. We're getting into um, design of products. Um, so in labor linearity is um, is a for me, it's more a paradigm shift saying we, we don't have to tolerate having a normal distribution curve. We can actually move for that. Um, but it needs uh, right-sized equipment. So basically all of the core concepts that we're talking about today, uh, 
uh, is a build up to be able to do that. Uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it's more of shifting our minds and saying, if that would be true, would that help us? Yes, it would. Okay. So let's spend time on thinking, what are the conditions that we need to create to make that true? Uh, and that leads us straight to uh, leveling or hejunka, uh, which has always been a significant part of, of the TPS system. And one of the things that Mr. Kado told us or uh, was very clear on in Japan was that uh, there is no other thing, there is no other thing that is more efficient in reducing cost than Heijunka. Uh, because it does suck out all that extra things that we do have in, uh, in our systems. But the funny thing is, how many do you know that are actually good at leveling. Have you seen any, Jim? I've seen a few, not not very often, but a few. But like you said, on the on the uh, labor linearity, it, it, which is probably this part of, there's a lot of effort that goes into being successful to, on, at that on that front. It is, it is, yeah, and it's not simple. Yeah, but it gives you all that extra. So when we when we say that we're actually looking for cost. Uh, we want to reduce cost. Of course, we need to reduce cost. Uh, but if someone tells you leveling is actually the most efficient way to uh, suck out cost from your, why are we not spending more time on it than we than we actually do? Uh, so for me, uh, these core concepts behind, they're often sort of hidden away behind obvious lean tools, uh, VSM, uh, 5S, and some other things. Uh, but they, they are only means to get to the end. And the end is actually a level, uh, level distribution of, of uh, work content. Uh, and that will lead to reduction of cost in all, all your processes before and after. Uh, so without leveling, most of the other concepts will not fly. Uh, so we're aiming for labor linearity, but we can't do that if we have fluctuations in, in demand. So we need to find ways to level demand so we can have steady labor linearity. So they're all depending on each other. Uh, so I, I get a question on that. So on leveling demand, would that be leveling the demand from your customers or leveling the way you uh, apply it internally. What what would be something that would help help level? Because there's, I guess, it'd be potentially two different fronts mm -hmm. that could come from. That's a good question. So, so leveling of demand is uh, how can we? Because the customer wants X, uh, and we need to deliver X in this amount of time. But we also have other customers that also want to have X amount of, of stuff. Uh, perhaps a different model and so on. So internally, how can we make a level work distribution? That actually means you know, we're not demand, where demand doesn't go like this, but it actually goes like this. Yeah. So instead of running all the yellow, yellow parts on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and then we do, um, you always, uh, paint in that, that order. So yellow then goes into more darker colors and so on. How can we actually make uh, a system that works? We can do yellow every day. Uh, so, um, and the main obstacle for leveling is usually set up times or, you know, or big equipments, which is gonna be our next point. So, so leveling by pushing leveling, uh, that is going to lead you to investing in other kinds of equipment and other types of uh, resources than you've had before. And that's the cool thing about uh, about leveling. 
because it does put the finger on all the things that that hurt today it is put under a magnifying glass with the help of uh, leveling or hedging. So that leads us to the next one, which is right-sized right machines or right-sized resources, right-sized uh, uh, organization, where in a big part of the world, uh, we have a tendency to buy big things that are supposed to do everything. Um, and we usually call those monuments as, as lean geeks. Uh, but the thing with monuments is uh, they're extremely good for a very, very stable demand. They're also good for uh, high volumes and, uh, and that part. The problem is today is uh, demand goes up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, the most companies I work with um, have a an offering in either products or services that is expanding. So the world is getting more and more complex. So if we keep stuck with that big equipment that is supposed to do everything for us. Uh, if we're stuck with that idea, uh, well, then leveling is not that simple. It's going to be super difficult to level. And if it's super difficult to level, well, we can't get to label linearity. Uh, so how do we how do we transform our our way of uh, looking at resources in a way that means we can actually be flexible? Uh, and I think that's been one of the, the key things for Toyota is them having multiple small machines doing a thing uh, rather than that big, massive, monumental thing uh, that ultimately it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to stop us from flow. Um, for me, that, that was actually right-sized equipment. Uh, my key learning that changed my life was uh, we had some coaches and they, they were actually from Indianapolis, uh, Jim. Sure. Um, but I was, I was running a factory uh, and we had this great machine that I had bought because I was production manager. Um, and I thought it was a, a great thing because it could produce X amount of products in an hour, um, Everything was depending on that machine, but as long as the guy who was running it was sweaty in his, in his forehead, I was happy. Um, and my coaches, they came by, came by and they were still sort of looking at that bloody machine. Uh, and at some point he told me, or asked me like, is that machine paid off? Oh, for sure it's been paid off. Uh, it was paid off in six months because it's so bloody efficient. <laughs> And then he said, please disconnect and put it on the yard. And for me, that was just like plugging the, the heart out of the patient. Like you can't do that. That's, that's our key thing. Um, but he could see that I, was, I wasn't there mentally. <laughs> so, so he went home. Uh, and the week after we went out observing and it was almost like a click in my head where I realized this stupid machine is holding back our entire flow. And it's costing us manpower, it's costing us complexity, it's causing all sorts of stuff. Uh, so eventually that machine actually went out on the yard. Um, so it's a, it's a painful realization that when you have things that you think are the key to our um, Survival is actually doing the opposite. Uh, it is a, a massive uh, paradigm shift to get to that one. One thing I found in that, Joachim, not only those costs, like you mentioned, like the the man the manpower or the the labor um, inventory, other things like that, is uh, it can reduce the capital outlay of the equipment itself because you're exactly. not spending so much, and then it gives you a lot more flexibility 
on more capital outlay because you can do it in smaller increments if need be due to the demand going up. So that yes. sound as an advantage as well from a, from a financial standpoint, let alone a functionality mm -hmm. standpoint. But, but it is one of the, the really big ones uh, to make the other things possible because we, we can't do all the other stuff that we need to. And, and the final concept of today is uh, if we look at product design, uh, because design itself has a, a massive input uh, impact on the way we can flow a product. So if your R&D section is not on board on the concept of flow, uh, they will come up with brilliant ideas, uh, but it's actually going to cost us 10 times more to do that uh, and, and stop our flow. So uh, how process design or product design or process design can increase work content or the energy use or space, strain, whatever that is, leads to a lot of uh, but it's also a massive opportunity to look at your, uh, what are we actually producing? What kind of way do we need to? Um, so we actually go all the way through uh, from drawing table uh, to production. Um, and I actually had a, I had an R&D guy. I was, I was standing in a factory and I could see this R&D guy uh, constructor coming by and he was looking at the machine like hmm ah the machine can do this he said and i was like hmm why do you ask well i think it's pretty uh, pretty cool we can do that so uh, i'm like yes you can do that but it takes the machine like four times the cycle time if you do that uh, and it's already strained so what's going to happen is you're going to need one more of those that's like a million dollars. And we don't have space for it. So we need to build another building. So it's going to cost you like three, three million dollars. Do you want to do that? He looked at me like, hmm, perhaps not. <laughs> uh, so we need to have everybody on board on. Uh, so we put all the, the bases in place. Um, that, that would be my point. And that was all we had time for today, Jim. Okay. Did we get any questions? Uh, yeah, anybody with any questions, certainly in the Q&A or in the chat, um, let us know. But uh, as we maybe wait for people to do that, one thing is certainly, um, Joachim, thank you for your time sharing this information. Thank you because you're- Thank you for having me. Yeah, you're doing this from Sweden. So you're, you're a few hours ahead of us. It's in the evening <laughs> where you're at. So thank you for that time. Also too, um, We'll do our third in the series coming up at the end of February. February, we don't have a, a date yet, but um, we'll have that coming out soon. So watch for that information. Um, also too, on the third one, uh, I think Joaquin, you'll be going through prerequisites for standard work is kind of a topic you'll go through that'll be related back to the first webinar. And you can find the first webinar on the Lean Frontiers website. And within 48, or 24 to 48 hours, We'll certainly send you a link to this webinar so you can go back and reference it. And also uh, we'll include with that when that email goes out, the PowerPoint that kind of summarizes what Joachim went through um, today. Um, yeah. So, uh, um, oh, so one question came in. Will, be, will you be at the TWI and Kata Summit in April? Uh, right now that's a bit tentative depending on a couple of things, uh, but I would, uh, my uh, main assumption right now is that I will be there. Uh, let's see what the future holds. Okay. Again, thank you very much, Joachim, and uh, we will be hearing from you uh, next month and look forward to that. Look forward to it. Uh, have a great day, all of you. You too. Thank you, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Cheers.